I'm in a pretty good mood. I am. I took a nap yesterday afternoon to make up for that hour that I was going to do. <laughs> y'all might not get out of here for a long time today. I just got a lot to talk about. Did y'all know, uh, you know the worst thing in the world? Let me tell you how bad some members are of this, people, of this church. So how bad some of these people are. Uh -oh. One afternoon last Sunday, somebody gives me these risk or these coupons to Christy Crane. You buy one, you get a dozen free. Now that lowers that person to know I, I was on a diet. <laughs> how hard it is to go buy donuts and be dieted. Yeah. I ain't calling no names, Teresa. <laughs> But, but listen, it was good. I found out I had willpower. I did. I found out you don't have to eat a dozen donuts just because they're hot. You can just eat two. And I'm on a diet. I'm laughing now. I'm down to 224, 217. I got, I got to have this baby. This got to come off. Well, glory. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Revelation. Now, I'm going to be looking at you cockeyed this morning. For some reason or another, I could not find my regular glasses. I asked my wife where they were, and she didn't know. This round, this round have, where's my keys, Doc? And she treats me like a young man. Where'd you have them last? You know, y'all know, you know nothing about that, right? And, and I said, I can't find my glasses. I promise you, they're somewhere. Okay, I had them last Sunday, but I don't know. So anyway, I'm having to use my readers this morning. All right, Revelation. I'm enjoying, and you know, we may not, we may just stay in Revelation all year. Uh, we just, uh, just wander through the book, you know, and see what God has to say. Stand with me. We're going to read verse 20 of chapter 3. Verse 20 of chapter 3. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now, that's Jesus speaking. If you have a Bible like mine, all those words are in red. That means that Jesus is actually speaking these words. These are words that he spoke back to when he got back to heaven, but they're still the words of Christ, and they're still just as powerful. Behold, Jesus stands at the door and knocks. If any man, that is mankind, man, woman, boy, or girl, hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, and I will fellowship or sup with him, and he with me. Father, I pray that the Word of God will go out, that it will do its thing, Lord, it will not return void, but it will accomplish its purpose in the hearts and lives of everyone that hears me in this building and through the Internet. Let it be so. Be glorified and honored in this service. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people say it. Be seated, please. The sermon is Christ knocking at our heart's door. Now the text is a message of salvation. We know that it fits in a message to the churches where Jesus had just given the sternest rebuke to the church. Now some people think that I'm hard to the church. You ever read what Jesus said to the church? Man, he was very, very hard. But right in the midst of it, God seems to send a flower of compassion. There's a, uh, there's a flower that's blooming in the desert. It's the sunlight after the storm. It's the mockingbird heard singing on a cold and dreary day because he says, listen, I love you, and I, I, I desire nothing greater than to have fellowship with those who claim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So very briefly this morning, I want to share with you three points that are on the screen. Who is at the door? Notice the invitation that he gives, and then notice how eager the Lord of heaven is to come in. First of all, who is standing at the door? It is none other than Jesus Christ with the candlesticks. He is the one, brothers and sisters, that walks among his people. In John chapter 2, he said, or in John chapter 1 here, Revelation, he said, I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and being turned, I saw in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, Gird about with the breast of a goat, with the breast of a golden girdle, it was the king of glory. His head and his hairs were white as snow, his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were as if they burned in the furnace. His voice was the sound of many waters. He had in his hands seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was as the sun shining in its strength. This is the one, brothers and sisters, 
sisters that's standing at the heart's door and knocking and wanting entrance into the hearts and lives of everyone on the face of the earth. It is the Lord of glory and He is near you today. He's not in the front of the room. He's next to your heart. I've never understood the, the philosophy behind sitting in the back of the church. Yeah, I'm talking about you folks. Because the first one that the preacher makes contact with are the people at the back. But everywhere that he speaks this morning, he speaks to those directly who's under the sound of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says, listen, I want entrance into your life. I want entrance into your heart. I must have entrance into your heart in order for us to have a relationship. But never does he enforce his way in. He's standing there. He's like the shepherd looking for the lost sheep. Go read Luke 15 about the man that, that, that uh, had the sheep that went astray and the Lord was willing to leave that 99 and go out looking, desperately trying to find that one lost sheep that he could not locate. Where is he this morning? Is he down here in this group? Maybe he's back there. Maybe he's over here in this group. Maybe he's somewhere out there to someone who who couldn't make it this morning, but you're listening by way of the internet, and he is progressively seeking you. And it's done that you don't have to be sitting out there saying, oh, I hope the Lord notices me. No, 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 brothers and sisters, he does notice you. He knows exactly who you are. He knows your failures. He knows your hang-ups. He knows your shortcomings. And he still loves you, and he still aggressively seeks you, and he still wants to be a part of your life. You see, the greatest thing that Jesus ever said, that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Yeah. He has come to save sinners. So if you fit that bill, he wants to come into your heart and your life today. He wants to be a part of you. But understand something, and understand this very pointedly, because a lot of people does not grasp this one element of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Lord will never intrude into your life. He never will. He never will. Some people say, well, I can't find God. I can't find God's will for brothers and sisters. The Bible says, and I believe the Bible, that anybody who earnestly seeks Him finds Him. When you seek with all of your heart, you will find God and you will find exactly what He wants to do with your life. There is no such thing, brothers and sisters, as a born-again child of God who has the teaching of the Holy Spirit in their lives who cannot find God's perfect divine will for their lives. He wants to be a part of you. Why? Because you're made in His image. Now what does that mean? Does that mean that God's got bifocals and he's standing up here in a brown suit preaching? No, 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 brothers and sisters. He is a tripartisan creature. He's mind, body, and soul. And you and I are made in his image. What that means, brothers and sisters, is that when God breathed into Adam's nostrils and he became a living soul, he became like God. Made in his image because he has a soul. Now no other creature on the face of the earth can claim that. They have a mind, they have a sense, they're rational, and they have a body. But only the one that's made in the image of God has a soul. And that is what God wants to have fellowship with today, your soul. And that is what is so important that God shed his, or sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. is for the salvation of your soul. But he stands at your heart's door. He's not going to intrude into your life. Only by invitation does he come. The decision is totally, totally ours. And the Lord will never come in where he's not invited. Now, churches need to hear that. If you don't invite him into your life, he won't come. If you do not invite the Lord into your home, he will not come. If you do not invite the Lord into your church, he will not come. But I promise you this. There's not a person, brothers and sisters, who ever called on the name of the Lord that hasn't been saved. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now notice this is a personal invitation. Maybe you have received a wedding invitation before. Somebody's getting married and they send out wedding invitations and, and the bride and the groom sit down and sometime with the family members and they decide, well, who are we going to invite to our wedding? 
And sometimes it's a group, sometimes it's individuals, and they kind of size up how many seats do we have, how many chairs we got to put out, how big a venue are we going to have. But I can promise you this, brothers and sisters, nobody will ever be invited to your wedding unless you invite them. And you have been invited personally to be a part of the Lord's wedding feast in heaven. He's come to you individually and says, listen, I want to be part of your life. I want you to be part of my wedding uh, 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 feast in heaven. And so he gives you a personal invitation so you can say, behold, I stand at Kemet's door and knock. I stand at Eddie's door and knock. He wants you, brothers and sisters. If he didn't want to come into your life, he wouldn't be knocking. Amen. And I promise you, brothers and sisters, he does not. That's called Holy Ghost conviction. When the Holy Spirit, the living God, knocks, and how does he knock? We'll talk about that in a minute. But also knows that it's universal. If anybody in the world, it crosses all genders, it's for everybody. If any Jew will open the door, any Gentile, any man, any woman, any child, any church door, any bar hopper, any prostitute, any dancer, any preacher, any Sunday school teacher, any choir member, any convict, any inmate, any atheist, any agnostic, any man will open the door. Christ will come into their lives. Amen. Amen. I don't know where we ever get the idea that people have to be in church to be saved. That's right. No, sir, brothers and sisters. Who service shall call them? Say where? The church? The bed, the bar room. Yes, sir, brothers and sisters, I believe that God convicts people with His Holy Spirit all over the world and anywhere in the world. Amen. If you'll call on Christ, He will gloriously save you. It doesn't matter the words you use. Just call on Him. Lord, I need you. God says, I understand what you mean, brothers and sisters. I'll come into your heart and life and I'll save you and I'll be a part of your life. You see, there's no soul anywhere, anytime in all of life before whom Christ does not come knocking. I believe that with all of my heart. I wouldn't be a preacher. I wouldn't even be a Christian if I didn't believe that. I believe that yeah. God was so unjust that he would let somebody die in the dark parts of Africa or on the Amazon of South America without hearing the voice of God at least one time. That's why it's important to send missionaries. Friends, we're becoming an unbelieving nation. Did you know that? So we need to raise up missionaries. We need to send them out. We need to be planting churches, reaching people, brothers and sisters, that we've never reached before with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because the Lord wants them to hear Him knocking, and He wants them to be saved. Amen. Now, how does He knock? He knocks in a multitude of ways. First of all, He knocks through His holy word. Isaiah 5.11 says this, my word shall never go out and return unto me void. That's the watch word or watch uh, verse for the Gideons. They believe in spreading the word of God because they believe, brothers and sisters, that the word of the living God never goes out and returns void. Now, what does that mean? It means it accomplishes the purpose that it's supposed to. When you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ preached through some verse or some preacher, all of a sudden, God convicts you. He shakes you and says, listen, he's talking to you. There needs to be some change in your life. Every time the word of God is proclaimed, that happens. Sometimes it's through the service. Thank God, brothers and sisters, for people that worship God and still congregate to his house. Thank God we ain't all gone to the TV and the radio station. Because every time, brothers and sisters, we congregate, we come into a building, and I'm glad we have a steeple out there because, brothers and sisters, Anytime anybody rides by that steeple, that steeple's preaching. There's only one way. There's only one way. I read somewhere where there was a, a college that was going to take the steeple off the chapel. Been there for 200 years because it had a cross on it. Oh, brothers and sisters, that's coming the ways of the world. But as long as there's churches, as long as there's people congregating, as long as there's steeples, it'll be preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Every song that's sung. Calling people to salvation. Now, when I before I got saved, when I was a young man, I dreaded the invitation. Oh man, I I went to church because that's where the girls were. Okay, let's be honest. I don't think it's no different today, really. You know. Amen. Amen. Look at all these beautiful girls. Yeah, yeah, boy. You go to church where the girls were, and so I do whatever I had to do. You know, be where the girls were. Lord, 
God how I dreaded that invitation. Just as I am without the plea. Oh, Lord, God, I can't. I tried to get out before they started singing the invitation. I had to go to the restroom or something because I dreaded that moment. Why? Because God uses his music to draw people's salvation. Let's God knock and get the heart's door. Now, I told you no a lot of times, but one finally, one Sunday, finally, during the invitation, I said, I got to go. I didn't go that way. I came this way. And what a difference it made in my life. Amen. You might want to consider that this morning. The invitation being saying whatever it is, I don't even know what it is this morning. What is saying? Think about coming this way instead of going that way. Amen? Amen. Just think about that a little bit if you would. Okay? Anyway, he also speaks through knees that are bowed. What do you mean, preacher? I believe God answers the prayers of his people. <coughs> people aren't saved, brothers and sisters, because there's not more prayer <coughs> set up on their behalf. Intercessory prayer. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. When we need <coughs> brothers and sisters and we call out for the salvation of the soul, God becomes obligated to work in that heart and that life and bring them to the point of salvation. When people come to the altars, they're not necessarily praying for themselves. They should be praying for others to be saved. That's what makes a church. That's what makes a revival. That it's not all centered around me and my little circle. But I always see people saved. I don't care who they are. I don't care what color of hair they got. I don't care what skin they have. I just want to see people come to Jesus. Amen. And if that's not your agenda, then maybe you need to find someplace else to worship. Oh. That's what my agenda is, brothers and sisters. Souls being saved and born into the kingdom of God. Amen. I don't care if they got purple hair. Nose rings, earrings, tattoos, ripped blue jeans. I don't care. I just want them to get saved. Yeah. Yeah. You see, brothers and sisters, we got this thing all backwards. You see, when you go fishing, you never catch a fish that's already clean. Okay? So me and God have an agreement. We'll catch them God cleans them. Amen. Amen. Right. And he does, too. He'll clean your life up, but you got to get saved first. <laughs> Every time there's baptism, you get back in that pool, there's somebody sitting out there watching the baptism. <clears throat> family member said, You know, that'll all be me. Mm -hmm. What a wonderful experience it is to follow the Lord in baptism. Right. What a yeah. wonderful time it is. And I wish you could have a part of what I have getting that at pool and having, having somebody profess Jesus Christ and put him in that water and bring, bring him up. You're doing the same thing that John and Jesus took a part in. Oh, what a wonderful experience. And, and in that moment of baptism, God speaks to your heart and says, that ought to be you. You ought to be the one being baptized today. Every TV message, every radio message, Every disappointment that you go through in life, every suffering in your life, every trial. The song that we sang this morning was about a preacher who was, uh, I, can't, I can't remember his name, I'll tell you in just a minute. Hold on. Charlie Weagle. I knew I couldn't think of it. Charlie Weagle wanted to be a preacher. The day he graduated from seminary, he went in, his wife said, I'm not going to be married to a preacher. So she left him. He was distraught and commit suicide. Went down to the creek or, or to, the, to the pond to jump in. And then he heard God speak to him and said, Charlie, nobody ever cared for you like I do. And at that moment, brothers and sisters, Christ entered his life. He was already there, but he entered into a new relationship with him of being what he ought to be. And so Charlie went back and became what God wanted him to be. But he was so distraught over the suffering that he was going through. But listen to me this morning. That suffering that you're going through is Jesus knocking at your heart's door, wanting you to be saved and wanting you to renew your relationship in Him. Every tear that falls is the voice of God knocking at your heart's door. Every time a new home is created, every time a party gets up and says, I do, brothers and sisters, that is Christ saying, I want to be a part of every home that is here and there. Every time a new baby is born, I go in the hospital, I get a chance, and I said, now, we've got to raise that baby right. You get out of here, that baby needs to be in the house of God. You need to bring him to church, not send him to church. Bring him to the house of God and let him hear these godly Sunday school teachers 
Let them hear the gospel of Jesus Christ taught and sang to them so that one day when they come to the age of accountability, they can receive Jesus too. God begins knocking at that heart door at a very early age. And you know who he knocks through? Mama and Daddy. Mama and Daddy. That's your job to wake them friends to the knocking of Christ and the invitation that they need Jesus. Everything keeps falling. I just help you a little bit. <laughs> Notice how eager the Lord is to come in. If anyone opens, I'll come in. Oh, brothers and sisters, I know that you know the day that you were saved. I remember mine very well. When Christ came into my heart, I opened my heart's door and he came in. And brothers and sisters, ever since that day, that's something that happened to me that I've never gotten over. And every chance I get, I just love to praise God for his goodness. Do you like to do that? Yeah. Now, let me tell you something. I don't know where in the world it come from. But I, I want to dispute or dispel this idea that Baptists don't shout. Because mm -hmm. I'm a Baptist, and I shout, and I think it's a good thing when we raise our hand and praise God because we feel something good. Yeah. I, think, I think it's a good thing when the preacher says something good, we say amen. amen. Now, if you can't say amen, you can always say oh me. Okay. I think it's good when we think about Christ and His love for us and sing it. Hallelujah! Those are good, brothers and sisters. Let, let me tell you, let me tell you why. I think it's good, brothers and sisters, to sway in the choir. That's where God moves you. I might sway with you. I, I, let me tell you what I why I think that people have got to, to the place that they think that you ain't supposed to shout the house of God. They got too uppity in their lives. You see, I pastored the church one time. Actually, I pastored it twice, my first time and my last time. <laughs> and it was a city church. Lord God, I don't know what in the Lord ever sent me to a city church for, unless they teach me something. There's too much politicking going on in a city church. Did you know that? I mean, let my little Sally teach Sunday school. It don't matter if she don't come back to time. All kind of politicking. Now, here's what's so funny. You see, that city church, at one time, was a country church. But when they moved up town, they got to be up in it. <laughs> oh, we're up in it now. We got to sit here and be straight laced. And listen, brothers and sisters, you need to be happy in the Lord. And that's why I'm never going back to no more city churches. I'm going to be a country preacher to the day I die because country folks are more laid back than city folks. Amen. I'm not too uppity that I can't praise the Lord. I'm too uppity, friends, that I can't uh, be everything that I should be to you. And you ought to be the same way. You don't have to put on a front. You don't have to sit there with your head bowed and your eyes hand in your, in your lap. If you feel like moving, do it. If there's something in the service moves, you do it. But I think, brothers and sisters, that God is all about freedom, freedom in His Spirit. Do you agree with that? I think so. We get so uppity, we think we know one God. Well, I'm, I'm not a part of that anymore. I'm not a part of that. I can't believe I stayed in that church for five years till they finally asked me to leave. Yeah, five years. Time goes by when you're having fun. But old brothers and sisters, he comes in. He comes into the hearts and lives of anyone who will invite him in. You don't have to have money. You don't have to have help. He's there for the downtrodden. He's there for the depressed. And he comes into our hearts, brothers and sisters, and he comes to gloriously save us and to give us all the benefits of heaven. Amen. Amen. You know, the other week, you probably read the news just like I did about this person, whoever they were. I've already got a letter, letter over to find out who it is. I'm going to send it to them that won the lottery and won $877 million. Yeah. How do you wrap your arms around that? How do you do it? <coughs> Oh, man, that person said they got everything they need. Blah, 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 blah. Well, let me tell you something. 
me tell you something. That ain't nothing, brothers and sisters. When I asked Jesus into my heart, I claimed all the riches of heaven. I promise you, brothers, that's more than that lottery winner got. And I'm telling you this, brothers and sisters, my reward goes with me into heaven for all of eternity. Whoever won that money, brothers, is going to die. And then they're going to have to leave it to somebody else to fight over. Oh, that's yeah, that, you can't wrap your arms around that. But think about it. Yeah. You know, when Christ saved me, he didn't get much. I like that song that said, I was just a beggar, but I became friends with the king. <laughs> and God took me in, and he made something out of me. He made me his child. Yeah. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm a child of the king, yes. rich in the things of God, saved, filled with the Holy Spirit. And I love Jesus, and I'm glad to tell everybody that. Yeah. How about you? Amen. Well, I got to move on. Time's a wasted. Well, actually, I got an hour left. No, I don't <laughs> Get that illustration. <laughs> Lift up your heads, O ye gates, be lifted up the everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, the great, the mighty. The Lord mighty in battle, the Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. To think that such a one would want to come in, into my heart and to sub with me. Friends, oh, what fellowship, oh, what joy divine. The God of all heaven comes into your life. And all of a sudden, brothers and sisters, you have a fellowship with somebody that will never, ever depart from you. It doesn't matter if you slip or fall, he's still there. It doesn't matter what happens in your life, God does not leave you. He's there to fellowship with you through all of eternity. You can just come in and sit down a while, tell him all your troubles, then listen to him talk to you. But from that moment on, brothers and sisters, you have a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Amen. As we close this morning, in the city of London, England, at St. Paul's Cathedral, there's a painting, painted by a gentleman by the name of Holman Hunt. The picture is entitled, The Light of the World. It is a picture of a home grown up with briars and thistles. The windows are all tainted, vines and branches growing everywhere from years of neglect. The grass has grown over the pathways you can see going up to the house. The hinges on the doors are rusty. But in this picture, there's a figure standing there. And what is he doing? He's standing there knocking. With one hand, he holds a lantern. The other one, he knocks. It's shining into every crevice of that home. But as he knocks, he's waiting for whoever's on the other side who will open the door and come in. There's a familiar story told by the gentleman who came and saw this. And as he looked upon this portrait, he said, Oh, this, this painter made a mistake. He forgot to put the doorknob on it. He said, no, 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 he did that purposely. You see, brothers and sisters, whoever allows Christ to come into their heart, Jesus will not turn and go in. It must be open from the inside. Once you open from the inside, then the God of all heaven comes into your life to live and be with you for all eternity. Amen. Amen. Stay with me.